Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here tonight with us. And a pleasure, um, pleasure from a distance, the Wind Challenge edition. This is a special program designed to showcase Wind Challenge artists through the years. The Wind Challenge exhibition series was established in 1978 thanks to the generous support from the Dina Wynn Art Foundation to showcase emerging artists in the Philadelphia region and beyond. This is one of the most prestigious exhibitions in our area. And every year, six to nine artists are selected to, to exhibit in our galleries. Tonight, I am so delighted to present to you Natalie Kinsey, a multi, another multifaceted artist whose Wind Challenge exhibition was put on hold during COVID times. But we're really looking forward to having her exhibition in 2022. It should be around January or February, so please um, stay tuned. Um, Natalie, how are you? Oh, I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for coming. This is just so cool. I'm overjoyed. <laughs> thank, no, thank you for being here tonight and presenting your work, which I know is fabulous, but I know you're going to talk about it. And before we go into your presentation, I just want to say that we are celebrating someone's birthday here, which is Natalie's mom, who is here as well. So happy birthday, Cindy. Yes. <laughs> Happy birthday, mom. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this is like, anyway, <laughs> Natalie, please take it over. It's yours. Oh, Your spotlight. <laughs> wonderful. Um, well, again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. This is so special to be able to share um, a bit of my work with you. I've created a little PowerPoint presentation, or I guess it's Google Slides technically, but I've created a presentation with some images and I'll share some of the ideas that are sort of underscoring my work. Um, and if at any point you have any questions or you want me to um, you know, go at, over anything in more detail, please feel free to um, ask or, or, or comment as you, as you wish. Um, I'm and if you and if you you're shy, you don't want to ask, you can put it in the chat. I'm happy to ask the question for you. So oh, either way. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, thank you for the assist, Gerard. That sounds perfect. Um, so let me share my screen with you all. How's that? Can everyone see this little yes. cloud flower? Oh, wonderful. So my name is Natalie Kinsey. I'm an interdisciplinary artist based in Philadelphia. I've, um, I've formally been trained in ceramics and in clay making, um, but I work in all different materials um, across disciplines. I moved to Philadelphia from a, a rural area in Colorado, um, and I've also spent time and lived in other areas of the mid and mountain west. Um, but I'm really just loving um, being in Philly. I came out here for graduate school. I attended Tyler School of Art and Architecture um, at Temple University. And I'm also currently an adjunct instructor there and a technical assistant in the ceramics program. Um, and it's been really wonderful to be able to dive into my artistic practice and my, my teaching practice alongside so many incredible artists um, in Philadelphia in particular. Um, it's just been such a wonderful community, but then also like having, being so fortunate to have the community and the people, my family that I grew up in. I think all of, like everyone here, you're helping me and I'm grateful for it. So um, I'm gonna, in this presentation, I'm gonna be speaking about some of my most recent works. Um, just as a general goal, like, and what I hope to do with my work is to create space for creative wonder and joy. So to me, for me and for my work, I do that in two major ways. Um, it's, you know, first and foremost, I'm celebrating creativity, playfulness and sharing. Um, it's, you know, one of the main goals of my work is to make it accessible and to actually share the processes that I use in making uh, my pieces. And then the other way is through my use of material. So I'm typically drawing on found and reclaimed um, materials and objects um, to 
to highlight the potential and the possibility for things that are discarded or forgotten, um, but also to present an alternative or a more, to present a sustainable future really through making, like how can we make, how can we make our, the worlds, like our daily lives around us more sustainable. And so for me, that's like my art practice is a huge part of that. So as I go through this presentation, um, I'll be you know, revisiting those themes throughout an, a few different series of works. The first one that I'm gonna talk about is my MFA thesis at Tyler School of Art. Um, this series was um, titled, We All Have the Sky. And it, I mean, I think it's really my first sort of attempt at, at or my first sort of, um, not attempt, but offering, I guess, if you will, at, the, at this, I, these ideas. Um, I was working in a number of different uh, material and processes um, using clay and painting references as, a, as sort of underpinning the work. Um, I was creating these, these dense canvases created on found cardboard. Um, and the surface, the surface materials I was using was everything from, you know, chalk, chalk and chalk pastel, porcelain slip. Um, and then I was adorning the pieces with these funky um, crocheted plastic um, sculptural pieces. It was really important to me in both the clay based work and then also in more of the two dimensional work that the presence of my hand was really evident. I think that's something this sort of sense of touch is something that I really encourage um, when I'm when I'm making or it's not not just encourage. Um, it's it's something I'm, I'm really focused on presenting when I'm making my own work and then it's something I encourage my students to develop is like their sense of touch, whether that's like the physical quality of their fingerprints in the material, or it's it's their approach, like what is their unique um, take on the on what it is that they're making. Um, and then I also with these works I'm using, you may be noticing it, it's this flower cloud like form, I call it a cloud flower or the little cloud flower. It was a motif um, that I use that I was using in this series and, and continued it on. Um, that was a, a, a sort of a stand-in or, or I wanted it to be uh, symbolizing a launch point for the imagination, um, which to me is the sky, like that is the sky. Um, and it's something that, it's something you know beautiful and, and across centuries people have projected their hopes and dreams um, onto it in a spiritual way but also it's 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 an ever-present moment of beauty and joy if we if we are able to take that in um, so it was really grounding the work um, and it was something I was hoping to also convey through my use of material um, so I was creating these really dense um, for me they were really dense uh, surfaces onto these these large cardboard canvases just sort of layers of slathered like uh, slip and then covering it in, in acrylic and glue washes to bind it to the material but it almost inevitably will begin to fall off and then I'd work it in again so it it's constantly this back and forth of of allowing the material to sort of have its own agency and then when I was installing it, I was, I was installing the pieces alongside these ceramic forms that were fired, they weren't unfired. So they actually went in, into the kiln. So they, they become um, structurally sound. And, but I was creating these sort of precarious installations with them where the canvases would balance um, on, on the forms. And then I was incorporating the, the found plastic um, into these works um, and in using it with crochet. Um, and crochet is something I'll talk a lot about in this presentation, um, but it's something that I, I've, it's a process that's been passed down to me through the women in my family. Um, and it's, it originally, my original and incorporation of it into my practice was I was seeking comfort I was seeking healing I was wanting to reconnect with something that felt familiar um, and so I started to explore the cloud flower form 
in, in the material of plastic. And I was also interested in processes that felt meditative or rejuvenating. And for me, and I think for a lot of makers and craftspeople, repetition and repeating a process that's almost becomes um, my, not mindless is maybe the wrong word, but it's almost like a mantra to, to make these um, chain stitches um, or to pinch, you know, make a coil pot. Like for me, that process is, is so relaxing. Um, so I was, this piece, I'm, I guess I'm talking about it with this piece. It was called Big Color, Big Love, this, this cloud flower, um, because it's, it's a, a crocheted cloud, cloud flower with like hundreds of strands of a, of a chain, of a crocheted chain. And the other thing I really liked about this process of the chain stitch or the crocheted chain is that it's one of the foundational um, crochet processes that all other stitch patterns can be formed from. And so I really loved it as this sort of um, stand in for potential, like what all these chains could become. Um, and also then them being made from discarded plastic and found material, um, just this idea of incorporating that, the, the possibility of that material alongside this this um, process that is also filled with possibility. Oh, I should have switched slides. Here's a detail image <laughs> of the color coming through. Um, I'm always thinking about uh, sort of layering surfaces. And, and I think too, I was really lucky to grow up around painters and so many, so many wonderful artists who I'm really glad are here tonight. Hi, Mrs. Arnold. Um, but so I'm thinking about uh, painting often when I'm making. And so I, in particular, this image on the left, I was really enjoying the color coming through this, the sort of crochet, the sort of the weight of this piece is pulling those stitches and making them wider and you can see the color coming through. And I really wanted the, if I'm thinking about these clay forms, these cloud flowers, I wanted them to have their own presence um, in the space and almost feel like they were coming al alive, sort of dancing around the room. And they're also sort of a direct representation of um, the mark making in my, in my cardboard canvases, um, where I would be layering this liquid clay slip and using my hands to, to create these forms. Um, and it the, underneath the clay is an underpainting or layers of, of chalk and layers of oil paint and allowing all those materials to blend together. Um, and with these very playful marks um, that are, you know, begin to reference the sky, begin to reference the land, um, and then you know, are speaking to the spaces that really have formed and shaped me. And then too, I was really excited. I'm, I, I love the play between discipline and be, between um, like the histories of disciplines, like the, the, the aesthetic histories. So I really enjoy when, when clay can read like a drawing or when a drawing can read like clay. I think too, it's another thing when I think about sharing processes and, and teaching, um, having like opportunities to teach. I really love to, to encourage people to think about how they can bring multiple different kinds of art making together to make something new. So for me, I also was thinking about these forms less as ceramic objects and more like line drawings that were becoming three-dimensional. And the little cloud flower then too, um, symbolizing this potential um, is something that I carry through to today really, um, even though I'm not using it quite so directly anymore as we'll see. Um, and so when I, completed this series of We All Have the Sky. It was, you know, the culmination of my graduate school experience. Um, and it, it, I felt really accomplished, but at the same time, I still had so many 
um, there's still so much I wanted to do and I felt so much I wanted to explore and there were still threads that I, I or, or, or like that I could follow. Um, and so the next few series are sort of different investigations um, that have come more recently. Um, and I wanted to think, you know, I was talking about celebrating creativity and I was talking about making work more accessible. But within that series, I was still just making the artwork all by myself. Um, and I wanted to start to find more ways of actually sharing it with others. Um, and I think that's too where we have this opportunity as artists to really think about, you know, what are the materials that we're using and how can, and what are the processes that we're using and how can they, how do they apply to our lives and our daily lives? And then how can they also be things that other people can incorporate into their lives? And so when I'm using the found plastic and I'm presenting, you know, crocheting with that material and I'm using it in sort of an art world context, there's still like a whole other world of, of working with plastic yarn and or like plarn as you'll see on the YouTube. Um, there's just so many different ways you can create in these different materials and processes. And I think that's an important, that's something I really wanna highlight with my work because I think there's a moment where, where that becomes an innovation and, and highlighting that can help others reconnect or connect to for even further a tradition or a community of making. And following grad school, one of the ways that I sort of started to rethink, like, how do we, how do I position this work in a more accessible way, um, was taking it out of the gallery space um, and starting to think about incorporating it um, in different or more portable ways is what I was thinking. Um, and rather than using the sky as a launch point for the imagination, I started to think about the garden as a source of cultivation and cultivating community um, with the same idea of using simple processes um, to make sort of installations that were site, site specific. So I started, my first sort of attempt at this was using porcelain to make simple hand pinched flowers. Um, and I was really lucky to have some dear friends like help in my studio and make some of these flowers. Um, but again, it's another one of these sort of repeated meditative special, like for me, special processes that are so easy to share. And when you're doing them with other people, it's just this moment where you can be together and, and talk and, and connect. Um, and but for a while, it was really limited. It was really just um, a lot of my colleagues in graduate school and then myself in my studio. Um, and then I started to think about, you know, I've brought the clay to the outside space. How, how can I bring the earth or the soil into the clay? So I started applying um, soil and, and forged clays into the porcelain material itself in small increments. It, it mainly served as a colorant, um, but it's just another way to sort of bring bring the earth into this this flower form and bring the the site specifically into the the object that i was making um and i started to develop this portable garden series where the the flower forms would be made um in you know different this particular installation was in new haven connecticut um and it was installed in a front window of um, art space new haven um, and it incorporated local clays and soils. And also um, eventually it grew to have sort of these window box flowers. Um, but still at this moment, I, you know, most of this was myself working in the studio. And then I had the really incredible opportunity um, to have a public workshop where I was able to share this process of making a flower. Um, one of a dear friend and um, uh, another Tyler alumni, uh, Juan Hurtado Salazar, was working with um, uh, Hills uh, Gallery in New York City to run a series of um, public workshops out of Hales Project Room. Um, so Juan 
curated and managed a much larger arts um, project called Notes on a Permeable Husk. And he invited me to hold a two day public workshop, which I called In Bloom. But really it was like, it was, it was a series, it was like me, we invited anyone who wanted to come in to make a flower. Um, and for me, it was like cultivating this garden um, through this simple process of hand building. Um, we also incorporated, you know, look like soils and, and found clay into the, so people could include that into the flowers that they were making. And it was really special for me. I mean, one, because it's just connecting with so many people, like people you don't know, but then you can share this moment together where you can make a flower um, and be a part of this, this sort of commun uh, communal like work, collaborative work. Um, but also the actual flowers that are made, like carry the identity or the sense of touch of everyone who participated, which was just, it was just so cool to, to see this simple process be completed by other people and then have all those flowers um, together. Um, and you can start to see the diversity in, in how people approached, you know, adding the clay into the surface or, or how they, what kind of flower they chose to make. I also really um, had a, like one of my favorite moments was when somebody taught me in this upper right here. Um, someone taught me how to make a paper flower at this workshop. So it was just so, I, it was just such a wonderful time to share both about art making, but then also just about life in general, which to me is like what the, the best part about art. If like, I think that can be basically the best part about art is when you can get to know people and, and what makes them happy um, or feel good. Um, and so over the course of two days, we, we put these flowers together um, and we created this garden together and then the pieces weren't trans carefully. Oh, I love this one. Sorry, before I go, this these little dot. Like, oh, they like made they separated the colors and they put them in the surface. Just it's so precious. And this person over on the right, they they sort of got they grouped together sand and they pressed the sand to the surface to really coat. Um, and they allowed these sort of cracks to form. It was just really special the different ways people made these these flowers. Um, but anyway, so for the duration of the show, or not uh, for the the duration of the workshop, the works were made on remained unfired on the wall, and then we we very carefully transported them to be fired in a kiln so they could become more permanent. And then at the closing ceremony, people were able to come back and either take their flower or take a new flower as sort of a, a you know, a remembrance or a memento from the experience. Um, and this really, I think this series, I didn't realize it at the time, but it really opened my mind into how I could help facilitate these, um, workshops, like alongside of the processes that I use. Like it, it was like a light bulb. It was an aha, aha moment really, um, where I can start to create programming around exhibitions that allow others to learn the techniques that I'm using. Um, and then, you know, they could carry those on or they could just use them as joyful experiences. And so really, I think that is something that I then wanted to pursue through my use of found plastic. Um, and I started to think about new ways, like new patterns that I could use with, with the crochet. Um, and my first, and I was working in these, these hand-built flower forms. Um, and I thought, you know, I want to expand this garden. I want to make it into, you know, almost like a meadow or a field. Um, and I want to use a, a crochet form that is really recognizable and really um, familiar. And, and accessible. And so I use, this is a, a blanket, a, a detail image of a blanket that my mom made for me. Um, and it's really special. It's one of my most cherished 
things. Um, and it's, it brings, I think it's so beautiful and it brings me so much joy. And I thought, you know, that's exactly what I want my work to do. I want it to, to be something people find beautiful and they, it can bring them joy like this blanket. Um, so I just, so I decided like, okay, I'm going to make these uh, flowers in plastic. Um, and I'm going to use this blanket, this, I, these ideas of, of comfort, um, and joy and incorporate them with these hand built flowers. And I, I called this series, um, we, the flower field. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to have these, um, sort of clusters of, um, of these dense uh, flowers that were you know, made of plastic um, and each one, you know, being sewn together. Um, and then, you know, with the plastic, it's, it's kind of hard to see. And then the, the porcelain flower going through the center of each. Um, and this was the first one in the series and it, in the, 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 the crocheted element stayed sort of one layer. And then I started to push the amount of layers that could be, you know, incorporated. So the forms start to become more dense. Um, and I, I really um, was hoping for the pieces to like very directly reference a crochet form. Um, and the sort of, this sort of, um, I guess exploration led to my first major <laughs> public art installation, which I'm really proud of and excited about um, at the Philadelphia International Airport in Terminal A East. If you're flying out of American, you can see this work. Um, and it's a really, it's covering a, a column um, that's pretty large, um, and it's and it's a, this combination of porcelain flowers alongside the found um, plastic crochet flower. Um, one of the sort of other material elements, I suppose, is this combination of a, of a very valuable clay material alongside of a seemingly lowly, you know, plastic bag. Um, the I guess the plastic bag is really just a byproduct of, of consumerism. Um, it's something nobody even like wants, they just get it. And then it ends up plaguing, you know, our world. Um, so I really think, but then I think that's one vantage point, but then it's also, if we wanna think about creating sustainable futures, we, how can we actually use these materials? Um, and so for me, that means, collecting the bags, creating a fiber and crocheting with it. Um, and so I like to think that by making this work that's that's recognizable and then with these materials that are very accessible, people can start to see how they could then incorporate them in their lives. Um, and also I was really lucky to be able to like pre-COVID times be able to hold public workshops in the airport so as people and passengers <laughs> were going to their flights or you know just hanging you know the layovers they could stop and learn how to make a flower or they could you know learn how to make the plastic yarn because there's sort of layers to or, or stages to the processes um and so that's been another really wonderful way to start to share these processes with others. Oh, and here's, oh, go ahead. I need, I need to mention that I was in that terminal and I was in oh. that walkway. And all of a sudden I saw that piece. I was like, oh my God, wait, I know this person. Wait, <laughs> this is beautiful. Oh. <laughs> it was, and it just really brought me a lot of joy. Oh, and that's so I, nice. I think that that is your intention. And I think it, it really, I saw so many people taking that second look at your work, you know, and it was really, it's really great. So oh, that's so nice. is, is it still there? Is it still up? It is still there. Oh, I, no. and, and I am really glad it, it was originally it intended to be a year long exhibition, but it's still up. So I'm really glad that it, it and thank you for sharing that, that, that positive feedback on it is really nice. Um, and I feel really lucky to, to, that it can be there and that people are responding in that way. It's really nice um, and encouraging. So everyone, when you travel this summer, remember, <laughs> go and see these. <laughs> um, and then sort of two other inst investigations that are 
related to the sort of crochet flower is this um, interactive sculpture, which is a, a, a rocking chair that's being consumed by, um, by a cloud, a flower cloud. Um, and then another, this is also at the airport, but it doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> it was filled with plastic. I wasn't thinking it it should be comfortable. I was thinking it should look awesome. Um, but anyway, so to make it more comfortable people, which isn't actually in line with what I do. So this wasn't a total, anyway, it's pretty cute. But, and then the other is um, sort of an attempt at rethinking how the process, like the crochet flower can be perceived because I feel the, when with the other forms that are more directly referencing the floral blanket pattern, it it becomes like very, it's almost, it's like right on the line of being cheesy, or, which I like, I like that. I think that can be a really great entry point for a lot of people into art um, and art making, but I wanted to push the form further to see just like where else it could lead me. Um, so this is really just continuing that layering process further and further and further. Um, and I think it gets to a new and exciting moment um, in, in this particular work. Um, but, it, but you know, this is maybe a part of, of a future series that's not fully developed at this point. And then sort of the final series that I'll talk about this evening with you all, thank you so much for listening this long, um, is my blanket series, which is um, a series of plastic, crocheted plastic blankets um, that are typically hung on the wall, um, but they can be you know, taken off the wall, they can be folded, interacted with, um, and really used as blankets, I suppose, if you, if you wanted to. Um, Conceptually, the work I think is still, it's still this celebration of creativity and sharing of process um, and or really celebration of accessible process and material. Um, but also I think it's a little, in a way it's a more personal um, series and a more personal celebration of, of this making tradition that I'm a part of, um, that I was able to grow up in. Um, I you know, my mom is here on the call. Um, she's the person really who has supported my art making my whole entire life. Um, and also like my broader family is, I'm really, really lucky that it, it's a, a family who celebrates um, creativity. Um, and so I think, and, and one of the ways that, that, and that, I guess that celebration didn't necessarily come from the path that I took. So I took, you know, a path towards a professional art practice and towards and into art academia. Um, but, you know, there, some of my greatest inspirations and some of the most talented artists I know didn't necessarily go that, that direction with their work. Um, so in a way, I think this series is also celebrating that, um, like, and also hoping to encourage people to connect with a tradition of making, that can that can be grounding um, because it's something that so many people share um, and share with others. One of some of my best memories. I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but it's I, it's relevant. I swear, some of my best memories are are with like include crocheted blankets that people like family members made or were given to my family and vice versa. And, and so I really wanted to honor that um, with this series. Um, in addition to, you know, using plastic in a way that can help with, you know, reducing plastic pollution. Um, I should have been scrolling as I was talking, but I have, um, they're also, I think, aesthetically referencing, again, painting, minimalism. They're these, they're very large. They're, they're, they're typically like nine feet by like six feet wide. Um, and they're using found and sourced plastic. Um, so I was thinking about huge swaths of color. They, 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 they have a really strong presence when you're able to see them in real, real life. Um, So 
some of the blankets also reference some of these blankets that I have memories of. Um, this particular one is using, the pattern is using the Fibonacci sequence to create the different um, strata. This particular, the rainbow blanket references really directly um, a blanket pattern. Um, I also see it as, I also see these stitches as individual brush strokes. Um, so this is a really exciting process exploration for me. Um, the, the way that plastic is being used um, together with the, a lot, you know, and the colors are being blended. And Natalie is a good question about the blankets. Are you making them on your own or are you, um, is it a group activity that you do with friends or? That's a really good question. Um, my, my, the person that supports me the most in my blankets is my mom. Um, so I would love to make it a larger group activity. I think that would be incredible and is a missing component of, um, it was, and maybe not a missing component. It's something I definitely and intentionally want to develop in my fiber work. Um, but shout out, huge shout out to my mom. Um, there's a number of ways that, um, like you have to first make the plastic and then you have to turn it into, or not make the plastic, you have to make the fiber. So you have to cut up the bags and connect them together and then, and then make it into a big balls of plastic and then you crochet. So there's, it's very time consuming and I definitely couldn't do it without the, that help and support. But oh my gosh, it'd be so cool to make one. Yes, I would love to. I feel like that would be so much fun to make one that pe it could be anyone who wanted to. It could be a workshop where people come and they work on this, like this, these blankets together. Um, I think I think the process of just seeing you making one, just you know, like I love to see that. So, <laughs> so you should definitely do a demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be so much fun. I would love to do that. Um, it would be great. Look forward to it. And this blanket, I guess, is um, one of my personal favorites. Um, I do, do people say that in artist talks? But anyway, so this particular blanket um, is the one in which I think most of my work that will be a part of the exhibition will sort of stem from. Um, and I'm really excited to, to share that work with everyone in the future. Um, this year, this is, they, these blankets are a part of a river series. Um, and, and I think it's going to be, um, well, this particular piece is referencing um, the landscape of rural Colorado where I'm from. Um, and then it's also incorporating um, color in a way that that I think will be a little bit more intentional than some of the other the, the previous works in the series. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share this series um, further. Um, and I guess too, with the I, I guess I'm really hoping that the I can think more about and speak more to how, like present more ways forward for sustainable futures. Like I, I, I need, I want to do more research um, that's in thinking about like an ecological identity and how, and how we can participate in, in like caring for our earth and like protecting it for the future. Um, and, you know, I think that this is my initial offering in, in that is thinking about how, you know, um, what materials am I using and how are they supporting that future? And then going one step further in making objects that, you know, they can be functional or they could be art objects. And then, you know, I think if, if people, I would love that to people to, to see themselves making their own, like, like using plastic to create their own, you know, art objects or functional 
pieces. Um, and I think that is, is the kind of reimagination that can help, you know, make our, our world healthier um, and, and give more access to the joys of making. Because um, I think encouraging dreaming and being feeling like free to dream is is really important to nurture in others um and i so i hope that this that work will be able to do that that's my goal um and so these last few things i think too are this is sort of the last year and a half or so this is really where my head has been at too and and that's the physical garden space um I feel so, so lucky to have a, uh, a, an area in my life where I can grow a, a, a true garden and, and learn every day from, from gardening and from cultivation. Um, very much a novice, but it's, it's something I'm absolutely loving to explore. Um, and here's another iteration, a true portable garden um, here on the right. Um, and and please tell me this is from last season. Yeah. This and I'm is way behind. Okay. Right now. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, this is last year. Um, yeah. And also, too, I, I'm, I'm like, the, gar oh, the garden, there's so much to do with the garden. It's beautiful space. But um, I would love to incorporate more um, natural material and material from the garden into the physical work that I'm making. Um, whether it's the sunflower and the marigold, like working with natural dyes or actually working with some of the, the m material leaves that come from um, these beautiful um, creations. And then another one, this is thanks, thanks this is thanks to uh, online teaching ceramics online. Um, and I have I've been able to work with air dry clay, which I never took seriously before, but now I'm just so excited to incorporate into my practice um, because it takes, it has such a strong character of clay. Like it's almost like you wouldn't necessarily know that this isn't a stoneware or, or a traditional standard clay. Um, but it's, it's um, much more, for me, I see it being closer to sustainability um, and it, it fits more in line with what the work that I've been making. Um, and also I really love, um, I've always been drawn to, to clay that, is, that isn't fired in the kiln. Um, so I think it's also just sort of right in my toolbox already. Um, so super excited. Um, and then sort of I will sort of this is a I guess a sneak peek of my blanket series developing um, because it will be, you know, a big part of, of my exhibition um, at Fleischer that I'm really excited for. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to say another big huge thank you um, to everyone for listening in and for being here. Um, and thank you, Gerard, for asking me questions. And, um, you know, I hope if anyone has any questions, let me know. I, I would love to um, talk more with you. And yes, we're not done with you yet. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually would like to start this conversation because um, I want to know more about this cloud flower. When did this idea came? When did this, oh, yeah. like, one day you just had this like, you know, dream and you said cloud flowers. <laughs> that is such a good question. Well, the cloud flower, so it's a couple of things, I suppose, that developed it. I was in graduate school at the time um, and I was, I was also, well, it, it actually developed from the hand, like the hand form. I was, I was in graduate school and it, it was really hard. <laughs> it was really challenging. I was out of my comfort zone. Um, and I was also working with the Claymobile of Philadelphia and working with, um, you know, different like students, like K through 12 students. Um, and I was thinking about hands as flowers because we would do this little thing to like get sort of get students ready. Like, hi everyone, let's see your little hand. 
hands like the and to me they just sort of they would like hold up their little hands they'd have clay on them and and I would think about their little hands as flowers um and then from there I started to think about this idea of sort of like morphing like what if our hands really were flowers and like they greeted people as as such like if we thought about our our like our being as that as that way and then to me I started to think about how clouds function in that way um I think there was a day in the city and I had never experienced this before but the sky it was at sunset and, and the sunset was so pink it was just neon bright pink orange and it was so dense it felt like consuming like it felt like we were the whole world was pink like with the the reflections off the windows and and this was early on in me sort of living in Philadelphia and, and not being in a really rural place where the it's not as dense like in terms of the buildings and everything so it was just such a like powerful moment to be surrounded just like in this color. And I think at the same time, I was thinking about hands as flowers. And then I started to think about the cloud as a flower and the, the cloud as a, as a symbolizing the sky and the sky symbolizing dreaming. So that's how that, that's how that developed. And I was thinking I wanted something that was sort of like quote unquote cute, but I wanted it to be powerful. So that's also where the name sort of comes from. I mean, it's very powerful. Um, so nature, nature plays a really um, big part of your artwork, obviously. And um, but you know, not we we don't we're not born just like nature lovers. Sometimes we notice, sometimes we don't notice nature. Was it your uh, surroundings when you were little that inspired you? That maybe like make you love nature that much, or Oh yeah, that's a good question. Def I think definitely nature has always been a, a huge part of my, I've been really lucky to be able to grow up in green spaces. Um, and it's something my family, you know, loved and cared about and instilled in me. <laughs> it, it, and I, you know, I think too, the, I was really lucky to be able to run out into the woods. Um, and it was always a source of excitement and and it always felt like a place where I could explore and 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 I think in a way it, it was some of some of my first like experiences of being creative or playing playing in in and around the like nature really but um yeah it's something I guess I then too always like I think it really instilled a, a you know a care for the earth um growing up in um, Madison, uh, near Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it's a, like an area that is very close to a lake and, and like so many people in my life, it was just a big, you know, the, the natural world and agriculture was part of, a part of that landscape. Um, and then I moved frequently in and around the Midwest and eventually ended up in, in Colorado where it's, it's the, the nature is so grand there and, and so present in people's like sort of lives. So I think it, it has always played a role. Yeah, in my life. And, and disclaimer, um, your mom says that you always <laughs> grew clouds and flowers, oh. and floating flowers oh. when you were a kid, so. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> Insider info. <laughs> Another question about your upbringing maybe. When was the first time that you were like, I love art. I'm gonna make art for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, oh, well, I think I've always loved art because I've I've been really lucky to always be surrounded by it. My mom is an artist, um, and her, you know, her father is an artist, and my uncle. I have a lot of art. There's a lot of artists in my family, um, and a lot of makers in my family. Um, so I think it's just something that I, it wasn't ever pushed on me, but it was something that was always celebrated. And, and I grew up in a home that was filled with art. Um, so I think I've always loved it. I think for a long time, I felt like I wasn't an, enough of like, like growing up, I don't think I felt like I was as, 
I don't know, like I, I didn't connect with drawing. Like I think when you're young, you think like, oh, I have to be technically really good at drawing. That means I'm a really good artist. Or so, I think that's maybe just an like my immature, like my child self thought that. Um, but then I, I was put into, honestly, this is it actually, thanks for listening to this ramble because it got to the answer, which is I was put, I, I moved to a new school my senior year of high school and I was put into a, a ceramics class, ceramics one or something. And I was disappointed because I wanted to be in painting. But then I took that class and I loved it. I just absolutely fell in love with working with clay. It was like a huge click. Um, and I spent all my time in that, in that classroom. Um, and I had never felt that way before. Um, and it felt like it, I could see my whole future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love that story. <laughs> well, I have a really good question here. Uh, it says, even though there is such a difference in plastic bags and clay, I see a lot of connections in how you handle each medium. Mm -hmm. What connections do you see? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you for that question. Well, I think it, it can depend on how the lens that you look at the material with. I think you can think about like the material of ceramic and the material of plastic and their sort of permanence. I think there's a direct connection to how long lasting those materials can be. Um, and then I think too, there's sort of this idea of a container, like a lot of clay and ceramic, you know, like a whole huge, like portion of the discipline is, is around vessel making and pottery, which is, I think there's a connection to like this sort of, I mean, it's totally different, but it, there's a connection to the, the bag as a container, the plastic bag. Um, so I think there's that. And then, but then there's sort of like a process connection where I think plastic is actually something that it helps you tend to and care for your clay making. Um, it, it's like what covers and seals it and keeps it um, from drying or, or it helps you dry it out or, you know. So I think they're related actually, like they, they are used together um, in ceramic processes. Um, that's a really great question. I'm gonna to have to think more about that too. Of course, um, of course. <laughs> um, you know, when I, look, when I look at your work, I see a little hint of decay, but that hint that I see, you turn it around into this positive thing. And I'm wondering, did that happen when you moved to the city? Like let's say Philadelphia, did, did you start like, for example, the rocking chair, uh, which is, um, you know, a, a ready made product that all of a sudden there's this huge flower in it Mm -hmm. um inviting you really to sit and interact with it oh yeah so um the so the did you the first part of the question was about decay though is that what you said right right mm -hmm. yeah well i mean i i want there to be a sense of decay because i i think there it there it's i i don't think that everything is just um a blanket of positivity um and i i think there is sort of a uh somberness in it because there it it is a problem how there there are, i guess the the we need to actually create a sustainable future like there will be a negative outcome for the whole world like if there isn't and we do need to rethink where we place value and how that extends to where we place value on you know people and lived experiences so i think i do want there i don't want it to just all feel um only positive, uh, I, I think, and also decay is a part of life too. I think the garden, the garden, like teaches you that things that's with the seasons, there are transitions and things die and then are reborn. So I, I, I want that. I want there to be a, a play between the sort of um, severity and the lightheartedness, I guess. Um, and so some, I think, some of my works are really just like like boom like this is playful and this is fun um and then others i think are a little more nuanced than than that at least that's my goal that's what i'm working towards and i can see this definitely like a, a sense of self portrait you know in your work oh, um really? okay. and i don't know if you ever um if you thought of that before or not 
I think a little bit with the the cloud flower um but I guess yeah and I guess yeah I guess I see that in process that's a great interesting feedback thank you Dred. Oh. <laughs> I can see it in like what I'm choosing to represent yes I do see it <laughs> well even with the blanket that your mom gave you that being something very personal obviously mm -hmm. and you really admire and and that inspires you to do work absolutely so, yeah. I mean and obviously every artist does a very personal work but with you I feel that that is very present yeah it is something that I really want to honor um I mean there, it's people in my life personally that I want to honor and it's also something I want to nurture in in other people like I want I want others no matter where you're coming from to feel like they could access the work that I'm making or they could take you know, they could take a process into their own lives or, or it's a connection like, oh, like I know somebody who works in this way and, or, you know, like that reminds me of a blanket I have, or I, I want those kind of connections to be happening. And I do want to ask you a personal question. It's about your studio practice. How, oh. do, <laughs> how do you work? How, how what's, oh. what's your day in the studio? How does that work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think it, I think it can depend on the day. Um, I think there's, I have a lot of preparation work, like process preparation work that I do, whether it's, you know, prepping plastic or whether it's like cutting paper or it's preparing some kind of clay. Like, I think there's always a physical there's either a, a moment where I'm just repeating a process and I love that. So I usually will start my day with like a mindless task like that, or it's something physical that's more manual, like feels a little bit more like I'm engaging my body. Um, and then, I don't know, I think when I'm making, I'm, I'm, I like to, it's a time that I can really center myself and, and in find comfort really. Um, because I, I work, so much in other ways, like whether it's, you know, my working as a technical assistant or um, as an educator that when I get studio time, I try to really relish in it. Um, but I've also worked it in ever since I finished school, I've, and at that time it was when I didn't have access to a clay studio or I, there was a, pure, a brief period like where I was like without like access to that. Um, I've been so lucky to, to be working at Tyler. Um, but um, I was thinking like, that's another reason why I really leaned into working in, in other materials is um, just because of the studios I had access to. Um, so I think about that too, with the work and the processes that I'm using, but. I did, hopefully that answered your question, George. It, it did, it did, yeah. <laughs> and um, before we wrap this up, um, anyone has any questions, please just unmute yourself and um, we'll, be, we'll be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> or there's a curveball and we're no longer nice. Well, if not, we can have some um, silence. Uh, <laughs> but really, thank you, Natalie, for being here. We really learned a lot about um, your artwork. And um, I'm really looking forward to having your show um, in 2022 um, and, um, and seeing these blankets that I got to see one in person. And really, you need to see them in person. I mean, there's no other way to explain them. They're gorgeous and, uh, and they're light and they, yet they do feel like a blanket. It, it's just amazing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all for being here tonight. And especially thank you, Natalie, for being here with us and sharing your work and um, and please keep us updated about any exhibitions anything that you're doing because we all we're here because we love you so oh so my please, god yeah. <laughs> so nice thank you so much Gerard this has been so much fun to be able to share with you and thank you so much for for your supportive comments and for being here it's really really nice to be able to share with you all well, everyone, everyone here is saying thank you to you. So, um, <laughs> do you have a fan base? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I'm a fan of all of you, so this is so cool. It's mutual. <laughs> and um, in that case, I will say um, good night to everyone. Uh, stay tuned. We have another Wind Challenge artist next week. And um, we'll see you soon. We'll be opening soon our doors. So come to Fletcher. <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Yeah, and happy birthday, Cindy. <laughs> Can't forget that. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys. I loved it. <laughs> Thank you.